Welcome everyone to today's session of our equitable online teaching series. Today we have a really special session for you. We're going to be um, meeting with Jason Kalchik, who has a very dynamic interactive workshop plan for you. And the topic for today's session is simple teaching strategies for fun, community rich Zoom classes. Um, remember when people didn't use Zoom to teach online? You know, it just came out of nowhere. I know that that's kind of a silly thing to say. Everybody knows that. But I still have days where I think about like, gosh, this is just so bizarre. Like nobody used to do this. And now it's all over the place. So this is a really important session. Um, and I'd like to really thank Jason for, for being willing to, to present, to, to, to be here as one of our faculty members from the California Community College System. Jason is an assister, assistant professor of English at San Diego Mesa College. And um, we've got his Twitter handle here on the screen if you'd like to reach out to him and, and connect with him in that way too. I'm going to turn things over to Jason and, and get things going. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I hope to live up to that introduction, um, but it's good to see everybody. I'm really happy to be here. I see um, some familiar faces and some new faces, so I'm excited, yeah, uh, to, to join you today. Um, yeah, when I was asked to do this, I, I'm not that big on lecture. It's not really a part of my class. So I thought maybe I'd just kind of uh, reproduce or, or design some instruction that I think um, exemplifies some of the, the principles that I hope to communicate. So um, I hope you'll bear with us and go through these exercises and um, participate, share your thoughts, share your ideas, share your expertise and experiences, most of all, and hopefully it'll be fun. Um, so we are going to start with a little bit of a warm up. Um, just a quick brainstorming type of activity that hopefully will sort of situate our minds in um, the discussion for today and um, help us focus around an activity where we can just kind of get the juices flowing and um, see what other people think. Um, so I did put a link in chat. It, it should take you to a web page. So at various times, you'll be going back and forth between uh, your, your browser window and our Zoom screen. But go ahead and um, just think about your experience uh, teaching on Zoom over the last couple of years and some of the feelings that you've had, some of the thoughts, uh, some of the um, emotions and things like that. And I know we're all complicated people and we've had complex experiences on Zoom, so maybe more than one a uh, word or two would be appropriate given that we've had a mixed uh, sort of experience there. So I'm already seeing lots of interesting stuff here. Weird, hated, past tense, um, challenging, lonely, connection, lively. Raggedy, AM, okay. Exhausting, I definitely feel that. Safe, accessible, convenient, opportunity, enjoyable, Rocio. Convenient, Eva, thank you. Okay, yeah. Seem to be some um, competition for screen space at this point. Uh, good. Okay, so you can go ahead and keep typing those in. This will stay um, available, I believe, even when we go off the slide. Um, but maybe I just share uh, how I would, yeah, let me put that in chat here. Uh, use this in, or how I have used this in my class. And these tools, these um, 
sort of examples that we see at conferences and in presentations like this are, can be really helpful, but it's really important that we situate them within the context of our teaching style, our specific students and things like that. I can't tell you how quickly I learned that just copying and pasting things that I picked up from conferences didn't always pan out, but it was always a learning experience. Um, but on uh, Monday in my co-requisite English 101X um, at San Diego Mesa College, we entered a new unit. Um, the first unit sort of about college challenges, strategies, and success. They write a narrative. Um, the second unit, we enter into a more thematic content. So 21st century life and culture. So through that introductory session, um, I have them participate using Poll EV. And it's always fascinating to me um, how each cohort, each semester, there's nuanced little new things. And obviously it has to do with the um, information storm coming at all of us, but always there's this theme of um, the intersection between digital media, the very trivial or fun and lighthearted and also the profoundly significant um, aspects of life all coming together. Um, so this is just a fun, interesting way for students to um, literally shape the material of the class um, and have direct agency in the conversation, especially for students who aren't as comfortable joining in um, in a dialogue uh, or, or raising their hands or, or using their voice in a large class discussion. Um, also, it teaches me about them. Like if I see interesting things that I'm not familiar with, I can ask them and they're more than happy to um, sort of offer their explanations and I can learn about, you know, new stuff. I'm kind of out of the loop with some new stuff. Okay, so um, that's why I did it in, th in that class. For our presentation today, the sort of reasoning behind it was to help build community as quickly as possible. I'm not used to facilitating sessions with, I think there's over hundred people in here now. So we gotta be quick. But what this shows me is that there are passionate educators who really care about their jobs and the instructional designs that they're making for their students, but also that we've been through a lot over the last two years. We've had some wins, we've had some losses and we have this shared uh, experience and this shared uh, sort of community. But there's a variety, it looks like, ways of thinking about Zoom. Some of us are really down for it and others not as much, but obviously here to learn. So um, hopefully we could take this momentum and pull that into a breakout room where I'm going to be asking you to have a more challenging conversation with a group of new friends. You might know some, some of the people that you're, you're put with, but I want you to um, uh, just react to the prompt that I'll be sharing with you. Uh, again, share your experiences, share your opinions, share your wins, your successes, your methods, but also hopefully we all feel vulnerable sharing some of our failures. I think um, as we try to show students, those are the moments where we have the chance to learn the most and reflect on our practice, okay? So you'll be going in there for about 10 minutes. Michelle, did you wanna share the poll? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. We just want to get a feel for how um, your experiences with breakout rooms. And I'll sort of set us up while she does that. Okay. Um, so in the chat, I am going to drop a link to a um, Google Drive file that we put together. It is readable. Um, hopefully you can see this in your browser. Can you guys still see my screen? Um, Okay, um, and down here, you can zoom in. So if you just click this plus sign, hopefully this makes it accessible because it's kind of um, small uh, and you can kind of scroll around. If you're having any trouble accessing this uh, link, we have another Google Doc that maybe would be an alternative if you're having trouble accessing these things. But just spend a minute looking at these tweets. I wanted to um, use this session that try to engage us in a conversation around the uh, practice policy of participation and sort of um, the different ways that we try to incentivize active engagement in our classes. So this is by no means an exhaustive study. It's just kind of what I um, looked around and was able to find online. Um, there's a, a variety of opinions here, um, but I would like to 
just ask you to think about what participation means in your class, what engagement means, do you have policies designed around this? And then um, when you get to breakout rooms, you'll sort of be having a discussion around these ideas, these concepts, and um, potentially these specific tweets, if you like. If you are, so I'm just looking for you to introduce yourself, have a conversation, um, hang out, try to have fun, express yourself. But if you are looking for a little bit more structured um, protocol over to the right, you can work your way through these bullet points, which asks you, um, what do these tweets mean to you as your positionality as an educator? What questions or concerns do you have? What are you curious to learn more about? Or maybe how does participation, um, how does it or doesn't it figure into your own practice? Okay. You want me to go ahead and talk about the poll results? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so we have very few people, just a few people who have never used breakout rooms. Um, so that, that's good. But whoever those three people are, just know that this is a safe and supportive environment of your peers. Okay. It's, it's all going to be okay. I remember my first breakout room experience and it kind of freaked me out a little bit. Um, and we have just over half of folks who've said they facilitated and participated in them. And then a pretty close split between the other options. 24% of folks said, I have set them up and facilitated them. So on the teaching side, most likely, right? Um, and 18% said they have participated in them. So some folks have only facilitated, some have only participated, most have done both, and very few have never used them. So um, I think Jason and I just really wanted to acknowledge that and be sure that everybody keeps that in mind when we go into the breakout rooms and support one another. Um, and we know that it's, for some people, it's, it, it's a lot more of an ask. It's a lot more pressure to go into breakout rooms with folks you don't know. So uh, let's challenge ourselves. And um, if you can't turn on your webcam, that's okay. We certainly don't require, want to require that of you. We want you to be able to bring what you can to today's session, but we, we, we are really hoping that everybody can um, unmute their mics and participate in the conversation. So are we ready to do that? Yeah, I, I think so. We'll okay. see you guys in about 10, 10 minutes or so. Okay, so you, you'll, you're gonna see an invitation on your screen now to join a, the breakout room. And let's, a couple people. Okay. So there's a couple groups of two. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Can you see the, the, the rooms? Yeah, I don't see any twos. Room nine. Um... Oh. Okay, I see. Room 17, yeah. It should be good. I can drop in and say hello. That would be nice. Okay. And I'm going to stop the recording while we're doing this part. Okay. Yeah. I was able to visit a couple rooms, and it sounded like there was some really um, Good conversation happening in there. So just sit tight. We've got about a minute. Uh, Michelle and I were experimenting with the settings on breakout rooms. We set the timer and then closed the room timer. Much better than getting cut off mid-sentence. Yeah. I never know how much time to give. Like sometimes students are like, that was way too much. Sometimes they're like, hey, what, that went so fast. Um, sometimes I'll put them right back in there if, if they really want to keep talking.
All right. Recorded. All right, I think we're all back. Um, so I did visit some rooms and I heard some pretty interesting dialogue. And so I thought we'd just use this larger space um, to get some ideas out there, hear uh, maybe what you have to say. Um, so please, I encourage you to raise your hand if you would like to um, share your reactions and your reflections. Um, you could also type in chat if you're more comfortable with that. Um, but the more voices we hear in, in this um, part of the session, I think the better. Yeah, Jane. Oh, well, we were discussing, I mean, I mean, on one hand, we did think that it was inequitable to grade on participation just because of, you know, there, there are some valid points in the Twitter about um, some uh, like African American student in the class of 150 would feel uh, like a target or marginalized, uncomfortable. But then I was also thinking, well, if you grade just on written, you know, what people turn in, then you're playing to the strengths of maybe students that are good writers. And what happens to the people that, that are more, their strength is more in verbal Artic, you know, articulating their thoughts verbally. And um, I mean, I tend to think that participation is inequitable, but I'm just wondering if there's some way to be able to incorporate the strengths of people that are, um, you know, maybe verbally uh, more so strong. They already have that asset. Yeah, oh, Elizabeth, yeah. Yeah, what I do in my class is I try to find different, okay, we're going to have an activity that is verbal, you know, kind of thing that they can come up here and maybe do a presentation or whatever, and then find another, like she says, maybe a write, because their, their skills are not that strong in writing, so that's what they're going to do, and somebody else, their skills are in writing, so it's going to show up in their writing, and I keep on, you know, trying to switch things up for, you know, well, this assignment will gear to this, this assignment will gear to that. So then it kind of balances out, you know? Okay. But yeah. I, know. I, I was a student, you know, when I was getting my A and my BA, um, would never speak in class. I was too embarrassed. I always thought somebody was going to say I was stupid or what, you know, how dumb, mm -hmm. you know. It wasn't until I, I went through the master's program and I did it all online that I got my confidence through those discussions. And now I can, you know, if I had to go back to school, I had no problem. But I was one of those students. I did well in my, you know, yeah. writing. But when I had to participate in discussion, no way was I going to participate. Okay. I was the same exact way. Uh, and it's interesting that now we find ourselves in front of room speaking. Um, but I think having that empathy um, and that understanding is, is a good thing. Um, and Jane, I like how you're seeing it as a, you're framing it as a way to reward students um, more so than coerce or police or compel um, and, and sort of reward the assets that they, they have to offer. Um, Greg, yeah. You're muted. Just take that off. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Uh, as well, Jason, I want to thank Hannah for mentioning a great idea about um, remembering that engagement with content can also constitute participation. That if the student is showing that they're engaged and they're learning, they're processing, um, that this peer-to-peer -peer or, or even necessarily peer to a student's instructor doesn't ne necessarily have to be in one of these traditional ways that we might measure uh, participation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Alana. Hi. Yeah, we talked about the fact that um, one of the problems with participation grading is the fact that we all have a different interpretation of what participation is. And I think if we um, consider what was discussed and, and that being, you know, some people participate, like you said, in content, some people, um, like my husband's an engineer, he would rather talk to a computer than a person any day. And so you can't expect everybody to be an extrovert. And you have to, if you're going to have a participation grade, you have to evaluate it in a balanced way. And one of the things that I have for uh, my students is I have their term assignment um, as a an option on how they can present their term assignments. So like for instance, in one of 
one of my classes, I have a, uh, a pitch presentation they can do for a business assignment. Um, they can do a, a new business pitch or a non-credit pitch or something like that. They can do a written presentation. They can do a video presentation. They can do a PowerPoint presentation. They can do a voiceover yeah. PowerPoint. All of those are within the one assignment as an option to present it. Mm -hmm. And um I have never had a higher quality of assignment turned in than I have since I opened it up to give them the choice of how they present their work to yeah. me. Good, yeah, the option, multi, many paths to this, yeah. to make the learning legible, I think is really important. Do, have you ever had students pitch an idea for you that you hadn't offered the option? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cool. And, you know, I, I'm open to that because, you know, yeah. I, if somebody asks me to write an essay, I'd rather have a tooth pulled, quite frankly. And I just, I don't like writing essays, but if somebody asks me to stand up and give a presentation, I'm comfortable with that. Whereas my husband is the total opposite of me. He would rather write everything out and just hand somebody a piece of paper or give them an email than he would talk to them. So, okay. you know, we have to just understand that everybody has a different strength and everybody has a different way of presenting how they've learned the content. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you. Hideo? Yes. Hi, Jason and everyone. Hey. Um, in our group, uh, my breakout group, I had wonderful colleagues and we were discussing um, grading, percentage of grading that you give towards participation. But where it quickly um, uh, the conversation went to is, you know, how do you deal with or uh, deal with students who are taking a course and we know that they're not taking a course in, uh, in a space or a place that's conducive for them to be learning in, right? So we have students who are literally at their job we know that because you'll hear that or see that because they're sharing screen or I've had mm -hmm. students driving right at the time mm -hmm. that we're in class or just uh, in a situation or a, 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 it's, it's a, I think it's, we found that we can do a lot with virtual learning because we all are forced to during the pandemic, but yet a lot of challenges came about it as well, such yeah. as this. Yeah. Absolutely. And Zoom delivery allows students to multitask and not have to commute. And I have students who are nannies and they're working and they might have to go do something, but they're also learning at the same time. Uh, so as many of us have been saying, offering multiple paths towards making um, that engagement uh, legible is important. Um, I, I'm sorry, I forget the name. Early, Steve mentioned that in a language course, it is sort of required to, to have to talk in class. And also me personally, I do grade for participation and I, I recognize it's problematic and my implicit biases are, are probably at play. Within the context for what I do, I think it works, um, but being very open as Alana and Hideo, you're talking about to um, offering other alternatives to speaking in class, although I am trying to encourage that as much as possible. Sorry, Tracy, you had your hand up. Oh yeah, we touched on um, the post reply discussion format mm -hmm. and we we're talking about, you know, is that even valid? Is it, it seems like there are prompts that have to be, you know, authentic instead of, you know, just like, oh, let me find somebody else and post it even though I don't really care about what they're saying. It's like, you know, it's just a right. thing that you have to do. And so that I think we need to really think about those um, prompts and see if they're going to actually help people, you know, to bring up their skills yeah. and their understanding. Yeah. So no matter the modality, the, the, the design, the instructional design and knowing your students and what you're going for is, is really important. I've been on so many discussion boards. I've set up so many discussion boards where the reply is, I like what you said there. Nicely done. And then, OK, well, that, you know, and that's a failure on my part, I think. Uh, Dominique. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to, um, and then please correct me if I say pronounce your name incorrectly, but is that Hideo? Hideo? Okay, yeah, so just, uh, just a comment uh, about like having the, the, the students in various places when they're in class, like you said, from the work and things like that. And then just one of the things I thought of is just something I try and do is really validate and say, I'm grateful that you're here in any way, shape, or form. So uh, just showing that that I understand your situation, understand things, you know, may not be, you can't just sit down and do this because you got kids and 
but just really reinforcing and saying that I'm grateful and I'm happy that you're here, creating a, a like a, a community um, where students hopefully feel comfortable and, and feel, you know, feel able to um, share their experiences and just be credible, but just saying, hey, you know what, you're at work. I know you <laughs> maybe aren't 100% here, but I'm grateful that you're still here. I know that there's still um, opportunities for you to contribute and, and for uh, learning to still take place. Yeah, thank you. And it's amazing how shocked sometimes students are when you give that grace. That we, perhaps they've been conditioned not to sort of um, expect that all the time. Eva, yeah. My initial, uh, I was in Hideo's group and my initial thought was they shouldn't be doing other things while they're in class. They can't do that if they're an, in an in-person class. So why should that be okay for an online class? But I think, I mean, the COVID has changed our world and helped us to be more um, equitable with students. And if we can allow them some freedom to make choices about their learning that, you know, it's their choice whether um, they're going to do that or not. And it, it may or may not impact their learning. Um, I think I personally would have a conversation with them about encouraging them to, if at all possible, give their undivided attention while they're in class um, but you know, you know, every every student has different things going on, different situations, yeah. and um, I mean, I'm in, an instructional designer, so I don't currently teach. Um, but if I were, I would, um, you know, consider making my Zoom recordings available to the students to watch later, um, and not necessarily require them to be in a certain space at yeah. a certain time. Um, although I may, you know, have some required times where they should be on if there's a discussion that we need to have um, together. But um, there's also ways to do that in an online format. So I, this is just making me think yeah. a lot about the options that we can potentially give students and also the options that professors mm -hmm. have to, um, you know, the students have options to come to class while they're working or driving or doing other things, but we also have choices that we can make in yeah. how we, um, how we do our grading, how we, um, what is required or not required for the class and what types of additional, um, accommodations, not necessarily for accessibility reasons, but in a different type of accessibility for all students to be able to learn the material and do well in the class. And, and that's yeah. ultimately the, the goal is that they learn it, um, not that they get a certain grade. Yeah, well said. And I think knowing our students and the complicated lives that they have, but also the um, many talents that they have allow us to anticipate those things, make those designs, build them in, but also we should be able to do it on the fly. Like if they mention last minute right before class that they're not gonna be there, maybe they get a, a set of slides where they can work it out, whatever was happening in class. Um, so we could create that for them on the spot. Good, Pega, hey. Hey, um, I had a really interesting uh, experiment that I tried out just because I was like, why not? Who's watching? You know, my deans and chairs aren't like evaluating me. And I taught a creative writing uh, synchronous class. And the first few weeks I did notice, you know, all the cameras turned off. I would call on students. They wouldn't respond. So I knew they weren't, you know, on, you know, paying attention. And for a couple of days, I took it a little bit personally, but then I started to like really deeply think about why I was taking it personally. And I said to myself, you know, when I'm on Zoom, I'm not paying attention half the time either. And I too have had meetings where I'm driving and I just had my camera off and nobody found out. So why am I acting like holier than thou, you know, and judging my students when I'm literally doing the same exact things. And 
I decided I was like, you know, let's just get through the pandemic. Like, let's try a no pressure approach. So I kind of created this um, this participation log that I started in my classes, and I sent it to my students around week four of that semester when I was teaching synchronously on Zoom. And I said to them, when you come to class, you know, on Zoom, you get to choose how you want to spend your time. You know, you could either turn on your cameras or keep them off and engage in dialogue with us. If not, um, if you just want to have a like, quiet time for yourself, I'll put you in the quiet room and I would put them all in a breakout room. If you want to use this time to just make community with your friends um, because you want to hang out with them and just vent and talk about life because that's what you need, go ahead. And then I put them in like breakout room three. And then I had another breakout room for if you want to, you know, engage with me, hear me lecture and things like that. So I gave them like four different breakout room options. And I just noticed ever since I did that and gave them the freedom to choose, they, they, I my participation in my classes, I'm not saying it dramatically increased, but it just got a lot better. Maybe my mental yeah. health got better because I let go of that control. Um, and I gave them options and I, I did notice it just got better. Like, um, for, for everyone, you know, when I gave them those four options on how to, how they want to spend their class time. So yeah. uh, I took the pressure you, off you and them, you know? Yeah. And I told them, I was like, I get it. You're not going to pay attention to me lecture and go over the content. If you're stressing out about a personal thing in your life, maybe you just need your classmates to listen to you, vent to you. So I'm going to put you all in this room and you guys just make community and help each other out, you know? And I just kind of said, as long as you're submitting your assignments and doing your Canvas quizzes and Canvas discussion boards, if I see that, you know, you're turning things in and your grade is not below C, I'll leave you alone, you know? So um, yeah. I'll share my, my participation log with y'all. Yeah. But it, I liked it, it worked for me. I'm now doing it in my hybrid face-to-face -face class, so. Nice. Um, yeah. Cool. cool. Thank you, Pega, for sharing that. And um, yeah, there's a lot of great ideas. All of these obviously come from a lot of self-reflection, a lot of experimentation and things like that. Um, one thing that's worked for me is very early on just emphasizing community and um, leadership as being a leader rather than a boss, pulling good things out of people as a way to be a leader. Uh, and that's a very important skill. I mean, I, I really don't like to commodify education as, as solely about getting a job, but it's really important. And this is something that students come to school with. So mentioning that being able to work together with others effectively and being a leader and now doing that online are hugely marketable skills. And in a college space, we should um, experiment and develop. Yes, I teach composition and rhetoric and literature and all of this, but let's also use this time to ex experiment and practice with these things and grow in confidence when it's a little less stakes because out in the real world, uh, it's a little more cutthroat. Uh, so just sort of pitching it that way as it being intrinsically valuable, I've seen students really kind of lean in and be like, okay, I'm going to speak up today, even if it's just once or twice. Um, really great conversation, everybody. Um, I don't know, I have some just overall kind of theory bullet points and some examples of some activities that I do in class that we can walk through. Um, the way that this was designed was to be flexible, like maybe we would do an activity together. So I'll share that um, in docs right now. Because we have um, such rich and varied context and advice. Um, this is something I might do in a class. Another way for students to show and demonstrate their engagement in the concepts and more importantly, share their ideas, work their ideas out in a collaborative um, way with others, this kind of productive struggle. Um, so this is very basic. Um, it's just with Google Docs and a chart. And the idea would be you would go back into your breakout rooms and then collaborate on creating one policy. And Peg has just done that for us. She's shown us a um, very clear direct, she could probably put a link in there if she wanted to, to share. Um, is that something 
we want to spend time with. We've only got about 25 minutes uh, left. So this is something I would do in class and I could monitor and I could comment on students directly as I'm teaching on Zoom. Um, like, what about this? Or uh, would you add this or something like that? Uh, so they'd get immediate feedback in their breakup groups and then they could um, process that and, and revise and things like that. I don't think we necessarily have time, um, but I'm gonna be sharing my itinerary. So if you wanna keep this open, I would greatly appreciate seeing some of your policies and, and practices and um, things that you do around participation. And really, it's all about just inspiring engagement and buy-in and trust. Um, but maybe skip this part of the session and move on, I'm thinking. Cool. I think that sounds good. And folks are populating it, so. Um... OK, yeah, awesome. And so um, I'm going to share, again, the itinerary for today's session. You can kind of check my. Um, are the resources that I put together and the, and the kind of design, but also you'll be able to access this again through that, that itinerary. So check back with this. Um, okay. So yeah, I think, although we weren't directly, what does this have to do with fun, engaging Zoom tips? Um, we went a little bit off the, uh, to the side of this conversation, but I, I think it's related. Obviously, uh, participation in Zoom matters. Um, we should never demand that our students keep their cameras on, but maybe um, ask them to or entice them to, or because as you know, it makes it easier for us. When we get those visual cues, um, it can be uh, really beneficial. Um, but the idea of today's session was just to sort of model some of the things that um, I like to do, or at least consider when I'm designing classes. Um, and so the first one would be to start with participant expertise and voice, really um, lean into the fact that students have a lot to say. They have a lot of rich experience and expertise, no matter what discipline it is. So making space for them to share that, making intentional space grounds their voice, grounds the instruction in their voice. They're more uh, sort of uh, personally attached to what's going on. They feel like they have some agency. So that's sort of why we started with um, that whole EV and then the breakout room. I anticipated that most of us are really concerned about um, Zoom and uh, participation in our classes. So I use that and leverage that in order to sort of generate um, or ground this session in, in your experiences. Um, I would say lean into community whenever possible, students facing each other rather than facing us is, is really good. Um, I feel like I'm like many of you, I didn't speak up in class. Um, it was a very traditional lecture base and then you raise your hand and, and you answer questions and stuff like that. Um, I didn't think I liked collaborative learning until I became an instructor and I had professional development with, with great people. And, and so um, again, students facing each other um, as much as possible. Uh, trust yourself and your instincts, trust your students, uh, make this trust visible and legible as often as you can. Um, as Dominique was saying, validate and affirm um, our students' situations. This goes for Canvas, comments, informal chit chat, um, responding to emails, take every single opportunity to build relationships with students and it'll really pay off in the Zoom sessions. Okay, I feel like I'm going through bullet points here. This is my least favorite part of this, this kind of thing is just me talking. Um, I say something, Jason. Yes, <clears throat> maybe oh, maybe it'll make you feel better. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I was just reflecting um, on that, you know, what you did, what you're modeling here for us. And I just, I mean, maybe it's too obvious. Maybe I, I shouldn't quite be so semantical. But, you know, I, I think that in all the years that I've worked with faculty, this real desire to have like a list of like, well, what should I do? What should I do? What are the activities? What, I want to build community. I want to build community. And we can't build community through any teaching strategy, any tip, any act. It comes down to the way people feel. 
And we've got to start with sending the cue that you matter here. I see you, you, you are bringing something valuable to this. And I, that to me is exactly what you did at the start of this session. So um, I don't know if, if, if those dots weren't connected for, for others, maybe, maybe that helps to just kind of reflect on that a little bit, because I, I think that's fundamentally the, the, the part that often gets overlooked and is so vital. Yeah. Thank, I appreciate that, Michelle. That's exactly what I was, I was going for. Students are an asset. Their voice is an asset. So making intentional space for that. Steve, did you want to jump in? Uh, you're muted. Yep. Let me see. Uh, there I am. There okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, my particular challenge is, is that my students don't speak English. They're, they're, they're beginners at English. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and they're often um, very um, uh, not uh, experienced in dealing with technology. So I've got these twofold sort of things going on where um, they, they don't know some of the very basic things about uh, the computer. And then um, they don't have a real good grasp on English as well. So um, that's really a particular challenge when you're doing with Zoom. Yeah. And um, one of the reasons why um, I don't like to use Zoom for, for teaching ESL, which is, which is what I do, mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it tends to put up more barriers than take down for me. And um, uh, it's, it's quite a challenge. It's, uh, I, I try and uh, 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 have exercises where they are. Uh, to try and develop community and put them into breakout rooms. But again, if you've got someone who speaks uh, fundamental English and, and they're, they're Vietnamese and you have someone who's uh, uh, Hispanic, then that communication between them without the teacher yeah. can be very limited. And, um, uh, you know, they're very uh, self-conscious about their English and, and don't want to talk for that mm -hmm. reason. So you know, Zoom is a really big challenge for non-native speakers of English. Yeah. There's, there's so many more hurdles for them to, to go through. So uh, just, you know, just wanted to mention that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I have uh, many students that come from our ELAC uh, program into my classes, and I definitely noticed that. And it's something that I, I do my best to attend to, um, encourage, but, um, it is a challenge. The tech stuff, the um, the language barriers, and um, one thing that I've noticed recently is my former my English learning students and my co-requisite. Whenever I have projects, they do like a podcast because they want to talk, they want to have their voice out there, but they have more time. It's not so spontaneous or something like that. So, offering that option has been really cool because. They love to hear their voice and, and we love to hear their voice, but it's not so on the spot where the pressure's on. And I've been speaking English my whole life, but I, I feel that pressure right now, you know? Um, yeah, Alana. Yeah, I have a lot of students in my real estate classes that are ESL students. And I found the easiest way that, well, the way that works for me to have them be a little more um, comfortable to speak is I have rules and regs right at the beginning. If they don't want to speak on camera, they can type into the chat. But I also tell them that I do not expect everything to be, you know, grammatically correct. If they have a question about a particular topic, they can put in that topic alone and just write that word. And then I'll pick up and, you know, explain that particular topic. And so that they're not feeling intimidated about that. But I also share just the simple things that they're already ahead of the game. They're in, in real estate, you're learning another language. You're learning the language of real estate. You're learning the language of law. And I share with them that they're already ahead of the game because they're already learning English. Mm -hmm. So they have the skill to be able to learn a second language. So a third language is not going to be so challenging. I myself do not have a second language. I wish I did. And I've yeah, tried numerous state. times. So, you know, I try to share with them just how, how much they've accomplished already and, um, and how talented they are to have been able to learn another language, particularly English of all languages. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Well said for that. Again, affirming that it's challenging and it's, it takes bravery to take those risks and, and 
just joining a class in another country. Like I couldn't imagine. Um, really good. Uh, so that maybe is a nice segue back to my bullet points here. Keep it moving or stall it out. Feel what's happening in the room, right? Like if things aren't hitting, you work so hard on these instructional designs, don't force it because it's going to frustrate you and them and that energy will come in a feedback loop. But if people want to continue on with something, um, be willing to throw stuff away. Maybe do it next time. Maybe you don't even need it. Um, so I found that really to be helpful for me. Um, one thing that also I find helpful is trying to, like you were doing right now in this um, document here, is make um, the learning or the thinking or the doing or the processing durable. It's something maybe that they can come back to um, and have a collection to review what happened in class. And for your students who were working a job or couldn't make it, you create a slide for them and they can earn their participation. I do use participation points, but they can use the participation points that way. So something that I like to do is use Google Slides not to present, but as a workspace that students can use to um, get into small groups, process material, bounce ideas off each other, and then produce something making them or asking them, I should say, uh, put something down on slides like this makes them accountable to each other. And they also take pride in it. It's something that other students will see and maybe they'll present out. And most importantly, they can see what other um, students have done and created and it, it helps for studying or, or refreshing their memories. So I would just create a template like this. For this one, we're looking at a poem uh, by Phyllis Wheatley called Thoughts on the Work of Providence. It's a long poem, and I thought it would be helpful to break it up into smaller stanzas. So on each slide, each group's doing a different um, stanza. This first one we did together, so sort of modeling it. And what I did in this little drawing down here, you can't really tell, but I was just annotating what they said um, as they were analyzing this first part. And then um, we built that in here. And what they were asked to do is just to discuss their annotations, their observations, translate the text into more legible uh, materials, put an image here, a chance to get creative. So now they're um, taking the ideas, processing them into a new form, a visual form. And this is just, you know, real quick. Uh, I put this together maybe half an hour before class. And usually it has, it, or always it should the design of these slides or this activity always um, should be around what I want them to get out of the the experience or the lesson or the poem. Some students go wild like this one there's a lot more than this one it doesn't really matter to me what like sometimes I don't even look back on these. Um, but the fact of having them do that, then when we get into the large class discussion, they have some expertise, this is their part of the poem and. Um, they're they're much more willing and equipped and they they've had each other affirm yeah that's a good idea so they, they come into the larger class discussions um, with that kind of confidence so um, it could be just a google doc like this um, or you can get creative however you like this is just one example um, so make it uh make the learning legible for us but also give them that space to work and, and sort of work through these concepts um be prepared some of us um i saw a tweet today that's that said it's astounding how um some of my teachers have never been online students and that's nobody's fault but it's it's kind of interesting like not having that context um uh I could see how that would make it even more challenging to try to to facil facilitate learning online um but being aware yep uh being aware of or just um fluent i guess in in windows and zoom and things like this to avoid these long lapses of of just us staring while we're putting breakout groups together or something like that um can be yeah let me go ahead and do that right now um can be helpful and we're going to make mistakes. We're going to screw up breakout rooms. We got to show ourselves grace at those times. But the the more we can minimize that, the better. The it, it's really easy um, in this attention economy that we're all competing with um, to lose uh, 
focus and and to lose our, our audience so this is something that works for me i use two screens i'm doing this right now um so just whether you do it this way whether you have two screens or not just have a um sort of protocol that you do or a standardized um, situation so you you're just familiar and it's kind of instinctual at, at, at that point so all my itinerary here i'll see my students here at the chat right here on my second screen this is where i share um, whatever it is and i just shared the itinerary making a detailed itinerary with links ready to go where it's one click and you can copy paste right into chat is really helpful but for me more importantly like taking the time to set up that very specific itinerary makes me think through well how are they going to react to this is that what i want them to get out of it um and uh and i'm making adjustments in in real time as i'm setting up those itineraries but a, but maybe the most helpful is just having all the links, whatever it is we're doing, collected in a space um, together. Jason? Yes. If yes. you're using um, Google Slides or Google Docs to capture student contributions, how do you go about identifying who adds what or does that not matter to you? Um, it doesn't. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I would hate to have them log in and, and all this. If, when I use Padlet, though, I'll say just put your name in the Padlet um, thing because some people are logged in and it automatically posts their name. I think it's a Google account. Um, so that I think would just depend on what you're hoping for um, and how you're monitoring uh, what they're up to. But I don't, for me personally, I don't see a point in tracking that stuff. I think just having them do those things uh, is beneficial and, and, and they're going to do them um, whether or not they're getting points, uh, depending on the vibe of the class. You know, sometimes I definitely will have a Padlet where you, you have to comment on here. And, and so I'll need their names. And then one final link, um, which links back to this idea of participation. Um, this I found to be helpful. I don't do this every time. But I sort of stumbled around this and uh, upon this, and I thought it was an amazing tool. Um, so I set this up for them to grade their own participation. So uh, they're thinking about, well, what did I do? What did I contribute to this class? And their scores that they give them are perfectly accurate or undervalued. It, you know, they underestimate their, which students always do. Everybody thinks maybe they'll inflate their grade. No, they they don't. Um, and then. The more meta cognitive aspect I, I had with this activity was uh, ask them to identify their favorite or more, most interesting text or what their midterm strategy might be. Um, so this allows me to see that they are engaged. So that quiet student where I'm like, oh, I, that really pisses me off. The student doesn't even care. All of a sudden I see them write a, a paragraph of this profound commentary and it teaches me, I'm like, okay, I need to check my biases and um, understand that even though they're not talking every two minutes, um, they're involved. Um, I found this one really helpful. Um, and again, have students facing each other. What is one thing you heard from a classmate today that stood out as particularly interesting? So you get that, um, crosstalk in that way. And then offering just some opportunity for them to have agency in shaping the direction of the course. Um, this was right before our midterm. And I was asking them, um, what do you want to do after this? And whether or not you take that advice, you can make it at least seem um, that you're taking that advice, because inevitably, some of them will, um, will be on the same page with where you want to go. I think that's it. Um, in terms of my fun Zoom community engagement strategies. Again, these are just ingredients. Um, I don't recommend copying and pasting. Um, just do what you excel at. And um, I hope this was helpful in some way. It looks like Eva has her hand up. Yeah, Eva, yes. I noticed you ask the students to grade themselves. What do you experience that some students are harder on themselves than they should be or not too easy on themselves and how do you uh, deal with that or, or yeah 
good um, question. I haven't noticed a pattern in terms of, uh, but randomly, yes, students are, are harder on themselves than they should be. I, I really like this. Uh, Sarah gave herself five out of four, um, which we get that too. And I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, but if it's really kind of become a, a pattern that's happening a lot, I'll, I'll reach out to the student and be like, look, I saw what you did in class. Um, let's look at the participation rubric, which is you know pretty general. And like you meet this standard. So in my opinion, I'm going to bump you up to your score. So keep that in mind and know that your uh, contributions are valuable. Um, and that's happened maybe a couple of times in my experience, but reaching out seemed to immediately change that behavior. Good question. Thank you. Yeah, Greg. Thanks. Um, one, one question I have is, I know that I'm supposed to take attendance. And mm -hmm. if I'm having a synchronous class, I have to take attendance like I did when I was teaching in person. So how do you balance the requirement to take attendance, right? Because I know that if I give a student a failing grade, I have to document, I, it's our system, I have to say the last date they attended the class, their connections with the financial aid. How do you balance that regulatory need with making things as easy as possible for students or not calling them out or not asking them to, you know, yeah. like, like, I love the idea of having the Google Doc where they're free to contribute anonymously. Right. Um, but then there's this other thing that we're supposed to do. Yeah. Um, so I haven't been taking attendance in the, in the um, sort of our campus solutions or whatever. Um, but I do take attendance just so I can score them. And um, in an in-person context, it's really like doing participation has been very helpful for me because I learned every single student's name on the first date. I have to in order to continue with this policy. But I just take a screenshot of the um, participants here that I can reference later. I have, um, I forget what it's called now, Snagit. So that makes it helpful. I'm sure there's a setting in Zoom for that. It, does anybody know um, if there's an attendance tracker? Yeah. Yeah, there is. You can actually go into your Zoom and when you go into your meetings, you can see who's attended and you can actually see how much time they've been in the meeting. Okay. And that's really fun when you're training faculty. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, to see how much time they're in there. But yeah, you can look and see it's in your in in your um in your reports part of your Zoom online. You have to access it through the yeah. website, not through the app on your phone. Yeah, I just kind of wing it, but um, thank you for that, Michelle. I appreciate that. Good day. Yeah. I had a curiosity um, based on your practice of having students assess their class participation. How do you facilitate that? So the, a document you shared, as an example, mm -hmm. would you have everyone share? So in other words, all their names are on there and they're adding to it so everybody can see yep. what they're putting on? Or is, are they individually doing that? And, and then you, you, you know, collect it all in one document? How, I'm just question. curious because I love yeah. this idea. I think this is a great idea. I, bu I build the, the template document with their names um, here. <laughs> and then um, I leave these spaces open. And so on the first one, I do sample student, grade yourself example, three out of four. Uh, maybe I should switch that to four out of four, I don't know. Um, and then uh, I'll kind of expand on these categories here, but then all of this is open and then students populate that. And so in Google Docs, I could just duplicate this document. If I maybe in my literature class do this five times a semester, most of the time I'm um, just tracking and, and paying attention to who's, uh, talking, not really in any kind of formal way. If they contribute to the class in any way, they get four out of four. Um, most students get four out of four. Sometimes um, there, there'll be a three out of four. But anyways, uh, just setting that stuff up ahead of time. I'm not sure that answered your question. OK. That did. Thank you. OK, thanks. Yep. I would just add one more thing there for um, just because I'm not sure how familiar folks are with Google products. Um, but if you're planning to use a Google Sheet, a Google Doc, Google Slides in a collaborative way with your students, it's important to know how the share settings work yes. so that when you share it, you are sharing it with anyone who has the link and giving edit access 
Exactly. Because you can have this those. very elaborate thing set up, and then if no one right. can actually type in it, it's not going to work. They're just sitting in their breakout room, annoyed. And um, yeah, so that was kind of what I was talking about, like kind of just know the system and double check, proofread, all the things we ask students to do. But you just click here, change. Anyone with the link can edit is what you would want. Great point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Michelle. I was going to say, um, I always tell them to open up the document before they leave and they have to give me a verbal like or a thumbs up before they go out to the breakout room so I can make sure that they can open it and edit it. So I tell them to do that. Yeah. But then also, um, I'm mentoring someone and one of the funny things as I'm listening to you talk is she started out Zooming only lecture. And then she started doing these Google Docs and Google Slides that we've been talking about. And she says, I just feel like it's so much more fun for me because I can get to know the students and their thoughts. And I think that's why we do it this way, right? Because in person, we can do that in Zoom. It's harder, it's just more work, but it's so much more rewarding for us at the end of the day. Yeah, self-interest is deeply baked into these uh, designs for me because it's way more fun for me because just sitting here listening to myself is not as much fun. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's time. I'm happy to stick around um, further, but um, that, that is if anybody has other questions or want to share other ideas. Um, I am really liking how this is getting populated. I'm going to really have to take a look at these things. And I tell you what, we will add a link to that document underneath the um, the archive on our website. And I'm going to put the link in the chat where the archive will be by the end of the week. Um, and if anyone wants to share that, we certainly encourage you to do that. Thank you, everybody. Great session. That was a lot Thanks, of fun. Jason. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for being here, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Take care. Okay, Jason. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Great yeah. job. <laughs> my, my pleasure. That was fun. Thanks I'll let you know when the archive's done. Okay. 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 Over and out. Wait, Mark had a hand up. Oh, maybe? sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah, folks. Okay, <laughs> okay, yep. All right, I'll see Bye, you. Mark. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Vernon. Thanks, Vernon. Okay. Bye. -bye.